Out of all of post-production, I think color grading can be the most confusing. And you might be like, sound design was confusing, so please tell me it's not worse than that. And don't worry, it's not. But when you don't have anyone to guide you with learning color grading, it's, it's tough. But I'm here to fix that problem for you. So, color grading means color correcting, and grading is a throwback term to the film lab, film lab days. And this course is gonna start like this. In this lesson, we're gonna cover some fundamentals that you need to understand about color. Things that will just benefit you as even a director, even if you're not grading after this. And then number two, we're going to get your editing room dialed in because there's things that you have to do so that you know you're color correcting correctly, accurately. And then in the next lesson, we're going to cover stuff with your computer and your display, which are also a really big deal. If you don't get this stuff right, you might as well be grading with sunglasses on because it's not gonna be accurate. And then after we've got your room and your computer where they need to be, then we're going to jump into the color page and then actually start grading your footage, okay? So let's start with some basics. Red, green, blue, RGB. Every color we see is a combination of red, green, and blue. And we see colors because of light. So you've got luminance, RGB and luminance. And these are things that you're gonna work with a lot when you're color grading your movie. So color's a three-dimensional type thing. You've got hue, which is the actual color itself, and then saturation, which is the intensity of the color, and then luminance, the brightness of the color. So if I had a red apple, a close-up of a red apple in my movie, and I took that to the color page, and I didn't touch hue, the actual color, but I changed the saturation or I changed the brightness, it's gonna affect how that looks to the audience. So there's a lot of different ways that we're gonna work with footage to get the look that we want in our movies. Now, so RGB luminance, remember all that. And then next I wanna talk about something that can be pretty confusing, and it's color spaces. So remember in pre-production we talked about the dynamic range of cameras, right? And how the human eye has a larger dynamic range than our cameras do. Well, color's similar. The human eye can see a really large area of color, and equipment is typically operating within that. So back in the 1920s, these scientists did all these experiments to try to plot out what the human eye could see. And in 1931, they released what's called the CIE chromaticity diagram. It looks like this. This diagram is still used today. Color spaces have specific chromaticity coordinates on this CIE chromaticity diagram. For example, this lesson is in the Rec 709 color space. Rec 709 on the CIA chromaticity diagram is here. So wow, Rec 709 is only like 35% of what the human eye can see, that's crazy. So a color space in and of itself is a 3D thing. It's, if you plot it all out mathematically, it's a three-dimensional object. So the chromaticity, di the chromaticity points that we see on the CIA chromaticity diagram is referred to as the color gamut for a color space. So a color gamut sort of refers to the max RGB and saturation values, whereas the color space itself encompasses light and all that stuff for the three-dimensional value. So you've got a color gamut and you have what's called a gamma curve that deals with light, stuff like that. So these terms are not technically interchangeable. A color space has a color gamut, and the color gamut is the 2D reference of where that color space exists. But sometimes they get used interchangeably and it can be a little confusing, so just Remember that, remember that as the separation. Another way you'll see color gamut used is to define what equipment can do. For example, if I go to BH Photo and search for displays, I can filter them based on what color gamuts they support. And you'll see things like, hey, this display has 100% Rec. 709 support, and this one has 99%. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means the 99% version has a slightly smaller color gamut on the CIE chromaticity diagram than a true Rec. 709 display does. So when we're grading, we want displays with 100% support of the color space that we're grading in. Which brings up another question. What color space do we grade in? And that's a great question. How many color spaces are there and how do you choose one? It's, it's actually much simpler than it sounds, but before we go there, I need to talk about SDR and HDR, standard dynamic range, and high dynamic range. So these are 
containers, if you will, for color spaces. You can kind of look at them that way. And SDR and HDR are kind of released at the same time as certain tech. And I don't know how that happens or why I haven't researched that, but here's what I need you to understand. REC 709 is the color space used with HDTV, Blu-ray players, 1080p Blu-ray players, your 1080p TVs at home, okay? So think about a beautiful Pixar film, for example, like Finding Dory, in your Blu-ray player, on your HDTV, that is only REC 709, 35% of what the human eye can see. Wow. Now this also applies to something we talked about in pre-production, which was chasing Ks. Sure, the jump from HD to 4K is significant, but is 4K to 8K truly worth it? Is the wow factor really worth it? And this, this will help with understanding all of that. Rec. 709 was the color space used with HDTV, and Rec. 709 is a standard dynamic range color space, which is confusing SDR with HD. But again, pixel count and color space are completely separate. For example, this is a 4K display, and it's running in Rec. 709 right now. The display behind me is an HD display, also running in Rec. 709. So, that's SDR. Now we have HDR, high dynamic range, and in HDR color space, one is Rec. 2020, and here's the gamut for Rec. 2020 on the CIE chromaticity diagram. This HDR color space is huge compared to SDR, right? So this is why the displays at a Best Buy, when you go look at 8K displays, and you're just like, whoa, 8K is amazing. Well, yeah, 8K is amazing, but it's not just about the pixel count. Those displays are HDR displays. So you're, they're showing you these gorgeous views, green lizards on pink flowers and all this stuff. It's HDR sourced content mastered and, and then shown to you on an HDR display. So you're not being wowed by 8K as much as you're being wowed by HDR. Does that make sense? And so this is why for shooting in 4K is, is totally fine because it's not about pixel count necessarily. So back to our question, what color space are we going to color correct in? And the answer is DaVinci Wide Gamut. DaVinci Wide Gamut on the CIE chromaticity diagram looks like this. So DaVinci Wide Gamut is a very large color space that can house other color spaces. Now here's the thing, we're grading in that, but we're going to monitor and deliver as Rec. 709. Why? Here's the reason. To accurately grade in HDR, it takes a lot of money. You're going to have to have expensive hardware hooked to your computer, and then that's going to be hooked to your expensive display. Because, for example, this display, this 4K display, is HDR, but is it HDR at a grading level of accuracy? Not even close. So you're gonna to have to spend a lot of money to do it right. And if you're not grading accurately in HDR, you might be doing more harm than good. Rec. 709 is not behind the times. There's tons of content being created with Rec. 709. And so we're gonna grade it without restraints. So your project is going to live in an HDR color space. But then when we, when we monitor and deliver, Resolve is gonna graciously bring that down to Rec. 709. And then at any point later, if you rent the equipment or buy the equipment, you can do an HDR delivery, okay? So what are our big takeaways from this lesson? Number one, we're working with color and it's a three-dimensional thing. It's hue, it's saturation, it's luminance. We're working in a color space and the equipment we use and the color spaces we operate in have limitations, certain chromaticity coordinates on the CIE chromaticity diagram. And that's called the color gamut for a color space. So a color space is three-dimensional, and then the color gamut is the two-dimensional plotting of that color space. And then with that, we're going to operate, or we're going to grade in an HDR color space, SDR and HDR, contain certain color spaces. Rec. 709 is SDR, Rec. 2020 is HDR, but they're not tied to pixel count. Remember, 4K display running in Rec. 709. So we're gonna color grade in an HDR color space called DaVinci Wide Gamut, and then we're going to monitor and deliver in Rec. 709. Rec. To be specific, Rec. 709 Gamma 2.4. 
there's different gammas with Rec. 709 and that affects the light and stuff like that. So the standard is Rec. 709 gamma 2.4, okay? Hopefully this makes sense. Color spaces exist. These standards exist so that your movie looks as good as it can from device to device. If you color grade and deliver in Rec. 709, I mean, if you monitor and deliver in Rec. 709, then when someone watches it on a display, the display is going to show it more accurately than if color was all over the map with no standards. Make sense? Hit up the community if you have any questions on this. I want it to make sense. In the next lesson, we're going to talk about some stuff with your editing room that's important to make sure you're color correcting accurately. And then we'll get into the your computer and then eventually the color page and start doing this. If you're interested in this stuff, if you're an aspiring filmmaker and your dream is to direct movies, there's something you need to check out. It's my online film school, Write and Direct, writedirect.co. Here's what it's about. I did the normal thing. I moved to Los Angeles and went to film school. I spent over $30,000 in one year of education and I put my heart and soul into the training and it was fun. But there's this sobering reality when you graduate from film school and it's this. The only way forward as a director is to begin directing your own movies because just, just because you went to a school and you did well and you have a thesis movie or whatever, it, it's not gonna land you a job. What does? Mastering the craft in, in directing movies. So it's a sobering reality for those of us who spent all of our money on our education. So I don't want that to be you. So the goal of Write and Direct is to not only educate you on the craft in a, in a way that I think is really amazing, we go from development all the way through post-production, but I wanna shield you from the typical, typical expense of film school so that you have the money to buy the gear you need and start making movies. The training is hands-on, it's self-paced, you make a movie during the training and I'm making a movie with you. It's attached to a private community where you can access me and other filmmakers and there's more than that. There's a 30 day money back guarantee. If you try the training out and you're like, hey, this isn't for me, you get your money back. Because my goal is to help you realize your dreams faster than I did. And whether I see you there or I see you here on the channel again, do not give up on your dreams of becoming a filmmaker. Oh.